So to follow up on the brave new world of information, we have Lindsay Coates from Interaction. Good morning. Um, I will try to be brief because I have this uh, strong gut feeling that there are lots of very smart people in the room, judging especially by the smart people on the panel. Uh, I'm going to make a few remarks and do a brief PowerPoint. Um, it's estimated that ODA runs at about $122 billion, and we estimate that uh, private resources running to the developing world may be as much as six to 75, $65 to $75 billion. Um, interaction uh, represents sort of the largest um, organized uh, source of that flow. We're a platform of about 200 NGOs, U.S.-based, that do humanitarian and development work um, all over the world. And I'll show you our NGO aid map in a minute. But you, there's a there's a perception of, oftentimes when you amalgamate NGOs that there's a large sort of monolithic thing. The NGOs are out there doing things. But it's actually a very diverse and varied civil society with that's interlinked all over the globe, even more so with technology than it's been in the past. Um, but because there's this monolithic, the NGOs thing, often viewed by pundits and, and commentators as extremely powerful and extremely organized, which I think it is actually not, um, this has given rise to calls from donors for more transparency and accountability. Um, however, operationally, for organizations working in the field, um, they're often financially constrained. They have very few resources for this kind of an infrastructure endeavor, which is basically what, what we're doing, is, is building a new infrastructure for data. Um, there are so many other actors in the field, in addition to traditional donor governments, you know, celebrities, philanthropists, um, uh, social entrepreneurs, and, and the bilaterals and multilaterals. So it's a very complex landscape. Um, but NGO sector is being challenged, I think, appropriately to become more transparent and also to prove its lasting impact. Um, and as ha has been noted by the other speakers, I think a lot of this has been donor-driven. And that's a real quandary. Um, the donor media sort of complex has driven a lot of that. For our community, uh, the earthquake in Haiti and the huge amount of money that went into Haiti uh, really created a, a crisis point and the constant attention. And Anderson Cooper, you know, uh, photographing the same set of crates sitting on the dock uh, in Port-au-Prince, all of that created a lot of pressure for greater transparency and accountability. And I think that there's been a shift, at least in the U.S.-based community, for uh, greater transparency. Um, our NGO aid map, which I'll talk about in a few minutes, uh, was something that we had been working with members on uh, for at least a year and a half. But it was the crisis in Haiti that really drove uh, the need to become, it's sort of like the, the members finally got, oh, we really need to do this because people are looking at us. And in the past, there has, I think, been a sense that, you know, you go off and do your work and, um, and you may have a relationship with the local government, you may have a relationship with the national government, you may not. Um, but you go off and do your little project and it's fine. And that's not at all the world that, that we're living in. So, I think there's been a recognition by some of the more forward-thinking portions of the NGO community, uh, something that came out of the Accra Agenda for Action um, was a group of CSOs, I can remember sitting in a little tiny room, um, not on the official site, um, talking about the fact that the Accra Agenda for Action um, challenged CSOs to evaluate and determine their own aid effectiveness and what were they doing to be effective. That gave rise to a very ground up process uh, that happened globally. Uh, there were partners literally all over the world who engaged in a debate about what does civil society effectiveness look like? How, how are we effective and accountable? And there's data is obviously a huge piece for the, of that. About a year ago in Istanbul, 
um, the, the group of uh, organizers of that original effort met and agreed to a series of standards for CSO effectiveness, which are going to be presented in Busan uh, with the encouragement that donor governments adopt and recognize these standards for civil society effectiveness. Now, they range from the things you would expect, like um, you know, promoting human rights and social justice, but there's also... Uh, explicit recognition. There are eight principles. If you're interested, you can go to the open forum for CSO effectiveness and see these. But specifically relevant to this conversation um, is an explicit focus on people's empowerment, democratic ownership, and participation. And related to that, the issue of transparency and accountability, that we in our own work need to be transparent and accountable, and we in our own work need to hold up standards of empowerment, democratic, and democratic ownership. Um, there is also a commitment in the eight principles to create and share knowledge and commit to mutual learning. So the civil society world was talking about some of the um, uh, values issues that undergird the data uh, proposition um, some time ago, but then getting to the point of sharing the data and the infrastructure issues is a very, it's a very challenging one. I think that there are a couple levels that you can think about this uh, from the CSO perspective. It is definitely going to change the way that we do business and the way we do and the way we work. There's a simple public level uh, awareness. For example, GuideStar has started to publish not only financial data, but they also rate institutions on transparency and accountability. Now, it's not the kind of sophisticated uh, understanding that this audience has of what those terms mean, but basically you can change, if you're an NGO, you can rapidly improve your, stat, uh, your status simply on GuideStar, simply by publishing your 990 on your, um, on your website and that people can go easily from a two to a three or a three to a four star. So there's a whole sort of public awareness. The people who are giving us money, um, the American public, are looking for transparency and accountability at a very national level. And this is an innovation that's just happened uh, in the last few months. And then there's also a, a systemic level of sort of how NGOs work and what is our human capacity around um, really understanding data, working with data, making it available to people, uh, because that's sort of, it, it, there's been a tendency to say, oh, that's just administration, or, or that's not about the real work. And I've seen a real shift. I know of a member organization that is working in Haiti, uh, and they have a, a large amount of money to try to figure out how to spend, and they're trying to spend it through local partners. And they've been struggling with that. And they ultimately made the decision to secund um, their COO to the Haitian organization so they could build the structures to track the funds to figure out what was going on. So it's a total shift in how you do business because of that expectation of accountability and transparency. So I wanted to talk, um, go briefly to the podium and walk you through the aid map. Let's see. So this has been our response to try to deal with the public pressure and public awareness. Um, and as I said, Haiti was sort of the tipping point for us. We had a vision of making data available to government, business, and the public for all the obvious reasons that, that, that we've been talking about. So we wanted to show that our members cared about transparency, to facilitate partnerships and coordination, uh, and to help NGOs and other actors be more informed, and also to serve as a tool for advocacy and policy. We, when we envisioned this two years ago, we weren't even ready to talk about data for stakeholders, because that's even harder, as we've been talking about. We've had a lot of success with this overall. Um, I would say 2,300 projects from 95 organizations, lots of visits to the site, lots of blogging and discussion about this. 
And overall, we've gotten very good feedback on the areas of our vision. Um, the transparency and accountability piece has been very useful, uh, particularly in the context of Haiti. We also have a map uh, that we've just launched about Horn of Africa, and we're partnering with IFAD to do a map about food security. Um, it's also been very useful for people who are delivering aid to be able to see who's doing what where and how they're working with you know, each other. So that's been a positive, a positive feedback and I think a success. Um, the, the challenge has been more around some of the other pieces of, of the vision. Um, it, the improved decision making I think has helped because you do have project data about how much is spent. What's really been challenging, and, and to me this is a big lesson for this group, um, if you have NGOs that are operating in a free society where there's no downside for access to information, uh, where there's access to sophisticated technology, and we're still trying to figure out how to use it for advocacy and influencing policy, it's going to, it's a big hurdle. It's a big hurdle, even for sophisticated advocates to say, and I think others have made this point very persuasively and effectively, but it, it's a big hurdle to be able to actually use the data and drive change with the data. Um, and there are no constraints. Because I think there are a lot of, of sort of outlier questions that, that we really need to think about uh, with this. You know, transparency and accountability is important, but how does that relate to impact? I mean, our data, interactions data, doesn't get really to the impact issue. We, we're working on it, but that's huge. And then the other, the other thing that's really important are, are things like the enabling environment for the use of data, uh, the consultation and capacity about sort of what data is needed, and the, and the capacity to use the data. I, w I want to leave you with... Um, something that was really struck me this week. I had lunch with a woman who is um, from India. She is a feminist Muslim activist um, in an organization uh, that runs something that, that we would recognize here as a woman's shelter uh, and safe space for, for women to uh, sort of realize their, their human potential uh, educational programs for children, all in Bombay. Uh, she is under a lot of pressure from the local imams um, because she's often identified as a not a good Muslim, not a good Muslim woman. These other women are in the home. Why are, why are you out here? Um, through the glory of the Internet, and this isn't even data transparency, uh, her local imam determined that she's funded by American Jewish World Service. And so she has faced another... Um, area of criticism because Israel is behind your work. So I, I think we really have to understand that, you know, an enabling environment, and this isn't even a government enabling environment because India has some relatively good laws about access to information, about the rights of women, um, but even then, you know, an individual activist, the sort of person that we might be interested in serving, um, may not be so well served by all the data um, that's out there. So I think a lot of the very smart points that have been made about sort of when and what are the critical points and who uses it and how you get access to it are, are essential because we have a lot of information, but I question um, whether that's going to be used appropriately for wisdom uh, and real social change. Thank you.